Uh, we're very excited to have Steve Levitt here today uh, for Becker Brown Bag. Uh, now, I don't know if this will be part of Steve's speech, but one thing is clear uh, from our organization of this event. Uh, given that it sold out in about 11 minutes, so since we have a lot of great econ students here, who knows what we should have learned from that? The price was too low, that's right. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Greenstone, and I'm the director uh, of the Becker Friedman Institute. Uh, BFI is a collaboration of the, and this is actually a true fact, many things you hear are not true, this is true, of the 300 PhD economists on the campus here. Uh, and we really have two goals. Uh, the one, one is to help foster the kind of research uh, that is Chicago has been historically associated with that helps people understand the world in a new way. And Steve is uh, about as good an example as exists. Uh, and the second is to make sure that those ideas uh, enter the marketplace, uh, the broader marketplace, not just the academia, uh, in a powerful way. Uh, and Steve is a, also a model for that. So in many respects, uh, the BFI is just an effort to try and uh, emulate Steve. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. I think he's, uh, Steve is widely known, uh, but he was awarded the John Bates Clark Medal, which is given to the most influential economist under the age of 40. Uh, he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 People Who Shape Our World. Uh, very famously, he is a co-author of Freakonomics uh, and Super Freakonomics. Freakonomics sold more than 4 million copies. He also has a podcast, the Freakonomics podcast. Uh, which receives 10 million downloads uh, per month. Uh, again, maybe he does not charge enough for that. Uh, so we can ask him questions about that. But and I just wanted to also say, you know, there's, one could go on and on about all of uh, Steve's accomplishments. But in many respects, I think Steve was really at the vanguard of teaching the economics profession uh, what you could do as people began to gain access to data and computers and how data, computers, and economic theory could be used to understand the, better, the world better and lend often very surprising insights uh, about the way the world operates. Uh, so personally, uh, I'm incredibly excited to listen to what Steve has to say. Uh, on Today, I think he's going to be talking about AI and big data. So he's capturing some good buzzwords. Hopefully, he'll help us understand what they mean. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Steve up here. Hey, thank you, Michael. Uh, it's gratifying that so many of you are here, although I know really you came for the lunch and you're all sorely disappointed that the, the caterer uh, decided to boycott uh, my presence. Uh, and instead, you're left with kind of uh, something second rate. But uh, Michael talked about changing prices. So we did, uh, in essence, change prices uh, and, and uh, raise the price for being here. But thank you for coming. and. Uh, uh, before I start, I just want to mention something briefly. So uh, I'm trying to do something very different uh, in the near future, uh, doing something non-academic where I'm trying to take Freakonomics kind of ideas and uh, instead of just writing papers, trying to actually go and, and change the world. Uh, and I'm looking for a handful of impossibly talented people to help me do that. So if you're the kind of person who thinks that a combination of Freakonomics and like a startup culture and uh, doing good in the world is the kind of thing that might appeal to you. Um, drop me an email or come talk to me afterwards. Okay, uh, okay so back to the topic today. So here's, here's my motivation for what I'm talking about today. I have spent my life trying to understand data and uh, I've really done it through the lens of how economists think about data. And we have a set of tools and I've learned from the really smart economists who develop those. And then over the last two or three years, more and more, to the point where you literally can't turn around without hearing about modern data science and AI and, uh, and these, these new tools, okay? And, and how they're gonna revolutionize the world, okay? Machine learning, okay? So I didn't know anything really about those set of tools and I thought, well, it'd be interesting to, to learn about them. And what was shocking to me when I began to study them just a little bit, I'm definitely no expert on them, is how 
completely and totally different the modern data science machine learning approaches are to using data relative to what economists have been doing for the last 20, 30, 50, 100 years. And, and it creates a puzzle because I know the economists are not stupid, right? I, the people, the best economists who thought up how to think, you know, how to use data were smart men and women who knew what they were doing and have generated enormous insights. But I also know that the computer scientists are probably even smarter than the economists, okay? And that the, the, the machine learning, that they, it can't be, it didn't seem, like, could it be that the reason that these two, I'll try to show you how different the approaches are, but could they be this different? Because one group is just completely confused and doesn't know what they're doing? And if it's not that, how could it be that two totally different ways of thinking about data have arisen side by side uh, and they really have nothing to do with it. Okay, so that's the puzzle that I came to, honestly, like a year ago, just wanted to understand. And this, what I'll talk to you about today is my understanding uh, since then of what's come to, uh, what I've come to understand, okay? So in particular, what I'll do is, I'll spend probably too much time giving you a brief history of how economists think about data, okay? And then I wanna talk also about modern data science, just to, to put the two into perspective. And then here are the questions I wanna try to answer. Why are the approaches so different? Because okay, they really are extremely different. Will modern, I, mean, I, always put mo I don't know what to call it, I call it modern data science. That's what I mean by machine learning ass. Okay? Is that gonna make the economic approach irrelevant? Because I, I, if you just read newspaper reports, I think you would believe that that's true. Okay? My answer is gonna be no, I don't think it will. Uh, and then I wanna ask, well, if you're an economist, what and how should you borrow from this new data science stuff? And what, if anything, can economic approaches contribute to modern data science? Okay, so that's, that's my agenda for what I want to accomplish today. Okay, so let's start with the economic approach to data. Okay? Starts with correlation. Okay, the most basic thing we have is correlation. Okay, and I want to give you an example, actually. And let me not leave this. Okay, when I was first starting out as a researcher many, many years ago, uh, I was interested in the question of whether prisons reduce crime. So should we lock up more people? Should we lock up less people? Okay? And so I went in the literature to try and understand what people knew. And I got a little bit nervous because whenever you, I don't know if you've ever done research and you, start, you see the titles of papers and you think, oh my God, people have already done you know, what I've done. My work is going to be completely redundant. So I stumbled onto a paper that the title was called A Call for a Moratorium on Prison Building. Okay? And it was an empirical paper and it sure seemed like these people had figured out that prisons did not do a good job of reducing crime. Otherwise, how could they have a title like a call for a moratorium on prison building? So I went and I, I tracked down this paper. It's a 1976 paper from a journal called the Prison Journal. And what they had done is they had divided states into those states that had built lots of prisons between 1955 and 1975, and those set of states that hadn't built as many prisons between 1955 and 75. Okay? So there was the heavy construction states and the light construction states. And it turned out that the prison capacity in the big, in the, where they built a bunch of cells, had gone up by 56%, and it basically stayed the same in the other states. Okay, and then they looked at crime. And it turned out that crime had increased by an amazing 167% in the places where they built all the prisons, and only by, only by 145% in the other set of states. Okay? And they looked at the data and they said, well, look, we built a bunch of prisons, crime went up more. That proves that if we want less crime, all we have to do is to stop building the prisons. If we would just stop building the prisons, crime would, you know, we would, you know, if we could presumably, just by not, like if we took all the prisons away, think how amazing that would have an effect on crime, okay? This was published in a peer-reviewed academic journal, okay? And what these guys were doing were using correlation to make judgments about the real world, okay? But in general, we know that's not a good idea. But, what, but, but I still want to say that correlations are the single most important element of data that we have. And why is it? Because a correlation is the only thing that God, nature, the universe gives us for free. Okay? Correlations are everywhere. If you have two data series, you have an X and a Y, don't know what they are, you can generate the correlation between those two. And those are right there for the taking. And that's incredibly valuable and useful because other than correlations, nature doesn't tend to give us uh, things other than correlations, okay? The other reason that correlations are important is because I think it's important to be able to draw the distinction between things everybody can agree upon 
and things that you argue about because of your preferences or your beliefs or your techniques or whatever. And the beauty of a correlation is that there's no reason at all that you send out two people from completely different parts of the world or the political spectrum and you tell them to, to compute the correlation between two variables why the aren't going to go and gather the same data, run the correlation, get the same answer. Okay, so, so it's nice to have a starting point where everyone can agree and then let divergence happen after that. Okay, the problem with correlation, okay, is that they just aren't useful. They're almost never useful, okay? Because all they tell you about is they tell you, what do they tell you? They tell you what has happened in the world. They tell you that um, it was cold and it was dark. You know, it rained and uh, the birds weren't flying around. Okay, they tell you stuff like that, but they don't tell you anything about why, okay? And for almost every question, at least that economists care about, why is a critical piece of it? Because e economics is all about having theories about the world, testing those theories, okay? And, and there's virtually no economic arguments that are simply descriptions without an interest in why two things are, are linked together, are or not linked together, okay. okay? So a real limitation of correlations is they don't tell us very much about the things that ultimately, at least economists care about, okay? So just as a quick diversion, so why are correlations not very useful? It's because there are many ways to get to a correlation. Okay, so I'm gonna use a notation here where this arrow means causality. So you can have a correlation between X and Y that happens because X causes Y. Okay, there's two variables, X and Y, X causes Y. And that's, when we think about economic models, we usually write them down where we have an X variable and a Y variable, and we want you know, to show that X causes Y, or, 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 or measure the extent to which it does, okay? That will generate a correlation, because if X causes Y, then when X goes up, Y goes up, okay? It can also be the case that Y causes X. Okay, and so in, a model, if you, in your world, you think that X is causing Y, but in, in reality, Y is causing X, which we call reverse causality. It still will lead to a correlation, the same positive correlation between X and Y that you get if X causes Y, but Y is causing X. So the inference about what happens if you want to go and intervene in the world is very different. So what I didn't say, so why do we care? So you might say, why do we care about the causal arrow? We care about the causal arrow if we care about public policy. Because in public policy, the idea is you have some variable you control. That's the next variable. That's how much you spend on, on um, education in public schools or how much transfers you make to the poor or whether or not you um, make marijuana legal. That's like an X variable. And then the Y variable outcomes, like are there lots of car crashes or um, do wages go up or do teenage girls get pregnant, things like that. Those tend to be the Y variables. Okay? We don't directly control those Y variables. Um, we control the X variables, and so we care because the only lever we can push on is X. And if we push on X and it causes Y, then Y will change. But if we push on X, but it's really Y causing X, then pushing on X doesn't do anything to Y at all. It doesn't do us any good. Okay. You can also get to a more complicated situation where there's some other variable that both causes X to change and causes Y to change. Okay. And so then, again, if you start pressing on X, X is not doing anything directly to Y. You gotta push on the Z, not push on the X. But if the X is the thing you control, it doesn't do you any good, okay? And then uh, most common, uh, most complicated is a case where X causes Y and Y causes X. And I think like a good example of this is police and crime. All right, so we've got lots of reasons to think that police, which is like our X variable, we can control that. If you have more police, you're gonna have less crime. But it's also true that when you have a lot of crime, you tend to hire lots of police. So Y is also causing X, right? So we would not have people in blue uniforms standing on almost every corner in Hyde Park if we didn't have crime, right? So the crime is causing those people to stand on the street corner, uh, and hopefully the people standing on the street corner is also causing less crime to happen, okay? But again, just a correlation in here will not help you understand exactly how much X is causing Y and exactly how much Y is causing X, okay? So correlation is just a starting point for what comes next, and so in terms of public policy, you somehow have to have a way to, to start to think about inferring causality from what you, occur in, in, in what you see in naturally occurring data, which is just correlations. Okay? And we have a set of techniques that economists have developed, and this is really what I mean in many ways by the economic approach. It's a set of techniques economists have, have come up with to try to deal with the fact that the world only gives us correlation, but what we care about is causality. Okay? So the, the, the one that's kind of closest to my heart is what we call natural experiments, or what I actually um, prefer to call accidental experiments because I think it gets at the idea better. And the idea is super simple. 
the idea is that um, really goes back to randomized experiments. Let me first talk. I will talk later about ran randomized experiments. But let me start by talking about randomized experiments. So why is a randomized experiment so amazing and so powerful? Okay. The reason is, okay, what is a randomized experiment? You take a set of people like this room and we, we randomly draw out some of you to put into a treatment group and the other rest you go into a control group. And then we give some treatment to one part of the group and no treatment to the other. And we come back later and we see what's happened to the outcome. So maybe some of you, we give, you know, this new flu uh, medicine that's been approved. Uh, so if you come down with the flu, we give you some flu medicine that's been approved yesterday by the FDA, the first one in 40 years. And if you're in the treatment group and you get sick, we give you that and we see how much better you get. And the other group, if you get the flu, we do nothing for you and then we see how sick you get while you have the flu, okay? And so the beauty of it is that because we've randomized you to treatment and control, if we didn't do anything to the treatment group, if we treated you exactly the same, when we came back later, we would expect that on average, the people in the treatment group should look exactly like the people in the control group, okay? And so all we need to do is compare the people in the treatment group to the people in the control group afterwards. We've now given the treatment group some treatment, and any difference we see, we think we can attribute to the treatment and the intervention. Okay, so the real power of experiments, of randomized experiments, is that you expect that other than the treatment, the treatment in the control group would have looked the same. Okay, and that's the exact same logic that economists try to exploit in natural experiments or accidental experiments, is we, got to, we try to find two groups of people who we think would have been the same, except kind of by chance, one group got treated differently than the other group, okay? But not with any real reason or logic, really by accident, okay? And so the only difference between uh, an accidental experiment and a randomized experiment is that the experimenter doesn't get to choose who gets treated or not treated, or even how much they get treated or what. You just kind of snoop around in the data, in the archives, and you try and find some examples of this, okay? And so in general, what's interesting is the best accidental experiments arise out of the greatest stupidity, okay? Because in general, we think in a sensible world, you should treat people who are the same in the same way, okay? And that's the enemy of the actual accidental experiment. In the accidental experiment, you wanna take two people who are truly identical, and because somebody blunders, you end up treating one very different than the other. Okay, that's, that's kind of the logic of it. So how does that happen? So um, examples are things like law changes. So you know, the law changes happens to come in on a certain day and, uh, and some people are grandfathered in or some people aren't or some people live in a particular state and others live just over the border in the next day if it doesn't pass the law or, uh, or the law says that if you're over the age of 65, this applies to you. If you're not over the age of 65, it doesn't apply to you until you've got people near the edges, okay? And uh, arbitrary rules. So one example I, I've looked at is um, it used to be in airplane airplanes use uh, uh, sales, airlines use have sales, and if the distance of the flight was 199 miles or less, then they would charge you $99. If the flight was between 200 and 999, they'd charge you some amount. If it was 1,000 to 2,000, and they had these really sharp divisions, depending on whether the flight happened to be 999 miles or 1,001 miles. Okay, it didn't really make any sense business-wise, just as a rule they used, and that induced a bunch of variation in prices for two flights that were pretty much similar. That's an example where you could lose, and you could look and see. Um, and um, anywhere really where you see sharp discontinuity. Now let me give you an example in practice uh, where we use this, and that's in Uber. So Uber turns out to be a great, great example of a natural experiment. So you all know Uber, and you, it used to be, I don't know if you guys used Uber long enough ago where you remember surge pricing much more clearly. So it used to be you would open up the app, and it would literally tell you that this ride is going to talk, co cost you 2.5x what the ride usually costs. Okay, and then a bunch of economists, including our own John List, went to Uber and told them that's a totally idiotic way to do it because when you make it that transparent to people, they're going to react badly. Okay, and so now that's all hidden in the background. It still happens, you just can't see it anymore. Okay, this on the x-axis is what Uber thinks is the exact true uh, price that they should be charging. Okay, and it goes from one all the way up here just to 2.4. It goes much higher, but the data gets farther. Okay, um, so and on the vertical axis, what we have is a share of people who, after they open the Uber app, actually end up getting in a car and, and paying for a trip. Okay, and so we've divided the data really into really fine slices. Okay, so the, anyone who's between, you know, point 
0 0.2 and 0 0.3, 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. Okay, now they never charge less than one, but there's lots of times when they think the right price would actually be less than their, their regular price, okay? So the bars here that are just plain white means that uh, that is not a bar where discontinuity is happening, okay? So, so over these bars, there's no actual change in price. Wherever you see the white bars, there's no change in price occurring, even though the Uber um, model suggests that um, you're a little different, okay? So you can see there's no change in price going as you move here, and there's no change in the purchase rate, okay? So it's like super flat because all of these people kind of do the same thing, okay? And then where you see a red bar is the, the one little tiny sliver of data we have that's just before the discontinuity where they suddenly raise price, and the yellow bar is the data just after they raise price, okay? So the people in the red bars and the yellow bars are almost act, almost identical in the eyes, ideas of Uber, but they face different prices. Okay, what's so cool is when you go white bar, white bar, white bar, nothing happens. Then you go red bar to yellow bar, you see a big drop off. Okay, and you see again, white bar is pretty flat, drop off. White bar is pretty flat, drop off. White bar is flat. Okay, it's, and that is the, the red bar to the yellow bar is showing you the, the, the response to price of people to these changes in price. Okay, and then when you have that, and build that data back into the usual way we picture for demand curve, this turns out to be this uh, now legendary, in my own mind, uh, demand curve <laughs> that shows you what I think is the first real demand curve that we've ever seen of something you care about. And when you add that up, so I don't know, if you know how much you know, but if you add up the area under the demand curve, that gives you consumer surplus. And by our estimates, the consumer surplus that was coming to, from Uber in the year of our data a couple years ago was at almost $7 billion, okay? which turns out to be like um, huge relative to Uber's profits, which were probably negative $2 billion. Um, <laughs> the amount that's paid to the drivers, which is like, I don't know, three or three billion or $4 billion or something like that. So really, this turns out to be the single most important component, this consumer surplus. And it's kind of not surprising in a way. People love Uber, people use it all the time. That's an indication that they're getting a lot of surplus out. But what's surprising maybe to us was that the, ad, the, like the, the willingness to pay for Uber was something like three times the amount of the ride. So kind of on average, like two thirds of, like if you pay $10, like $7, on average, if push come to shove, consumers would, would have been willing to pay like 20 bucks for that same ride. Okay. And so, uh, there seems to be huge consumer surplus, which also is kind of odd if you think about because this is all consumer surplus in a world in which Lyft is also out there. So even given the other options, people seem to get tons and tons of consumer surplus from Uber. Okay, all right, so let's go past that now to talk about structural estimation. Okay, now structural estimation, uh, in essence, I don't want to talk much about it. It's a different approach, one that a lot of resources in economics are currently invested in. Uh, and what it tries to do, usually in the absence of really good accidental experiments or randomized experiments. It tries to use economic theory or maybe just functional form assumptions if you have to, to try to, to tell you, given the data you have, how could you then come up with what we call these deep structural parameters that actually describe the causal mechanism in the world and you could then e extrapolate those to other settings, okay? It's totally a different discussion to talk about how successful economists are in doing that, but it's a set of tools that econ economists use for doing it. Uh, I'm going to skip this in, in the in nature of time. I'm skip the third point. Okay, and then the last point is randomized experiments. Okay, so economists were late to the game in terms of using randomized experiments. I mean, uh, they've been used in agronomy and, and psychology for a long time, but only really have they been really, really common in economics in the last, say, 20 years. Uh, but they've come to be a really powerful tool. Okay, when they're, they're randomized experiments in the lab. Economists use it, but more and more economists think about randomized field experiments. So field experiments that are done out in the field that are um, creating insights about stuff. And the, all, the one I want to talk about just super quickly was my own rather odd randomized experiment where I was interested in the question of whether or not people, um, people are uh, quit too much or too little, okay? Whether they say, you know, quit jobs or end relationships uh, more or less than they should. It's, economists have so much to say, like with all these models about how people should behave, but we don't really have a lot of evidence about how people do behave. Okay? So the thought was, how could I figure that out? And uh, it's not easy, so let's say I want to think about like divorce. Okay? How would I figure out whether people 
stay married too long or too little. Okay, so what you want to know is, well, you want to know, well, if, if people get divorced, so, say you take two sets of people, okay, and they're right on the margin for getting divorced, and one set does, and you see whether they're happier, you know, six months ago, later, than the people who don't get divorced, right? That would be the, the thought experiment, okay? So it's hard to think about how you're going to do that in the real world, because number one, I don't get to divorce and not divorce people, and, uh, and it's, I couldn't really think of a good accidental experiment. But what I decided, what I learned actually, um, because Dubner does these Freakonomic podcasts, and after he does podcasts, like a thousand people write to me and say how they changed, how his podcast changed their life, because we share a joint Freakonomics email address. And it suddenly occurred to me, Dubner changes people's lives. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that people listen to Dubner, and I'm going to try to change your lives as well. And so what I did is I built a web page, um, and we advertised it, and it was called Freakonomics Experiments. And you could go there, and we advertised, look, if you're having trouble making a decision in your life, come to our web page, and we'll help solve your problems. And we we um, we did also, you know, we try to get we we pretended to try to solve people's problems by having them think differently and ask different questions. But what we really wanted at the end of the day, was for them to say, I'm still just as confused as I was before I got to your webpage. And then we said, OK, then we'll do you the ultimate favor. And we had this beautiful uh, um, virtual coin that would be tossed up in the air. And if it came up heads, then you would get divorced, quit your job, you know, get a tattoo, whatever. <laughs> and if it came up tails, you wouldn't. Okay? And what was so interesting is that like 25,000 people came to the website and flipped the coin. <laughs> and even more interesting, they actually followed the coin toss. So here is, um, here's another picture, which is one of, for me, one of the most uh, interesting, gratifying figures I've ever made in a paper. Okay? So here, before they flipped the coin, we asked them how likely they were to get divorced or quit the job, whatever. Okay? And they could give an answer anyway from, you know, from 0 to 100. Okay? Then we randomly assigned them, flipped the coin, okay? And the people who got yes, you know, make the change, they're in the green line. And the vertical axis is how many people actually made the change, okay? And if you got no, don't make a change, then you were the orange line here, okay? So you take people who said at the beginning, I am not going to change no matter what, okay? They still flip the coin. And it turns out that something like 20% of them who got heads ended up making the change. And uh, only like maybe, I don't know, 12% of the people who didn't get heads made the change. Okay? What's interesting is across the entire scope of how likely people said they would make the change, the green line is well above the orange line. Okay? So the, the difference between these two lines is vertical distance is how impactful our coin toss was on what people actually did in their lives. Okay? This is all assuming reporting stuff. There's a lot of issues floating around that we deal with in, in the academic paper. But I really believe this to be mostly true. And what's interesting, he said, people kind of knew with themselves. Like the people who said they were likely to make a change, they were much more likely to make a change on average than the people who didn't. Okay? But, but people were far too extreme in thinking they would for sure or wouldn't for sure make a, a change. Okay? But then most interesting is we followed them up. And six months later, when we asked them, it turned out that the people who got heads, okay, so the per people who got the green line, were for almost every question that mattered, where it was like a question where it could affect your life. Like some questions say, should I go to this movie or that movie? But anything that was important, the people who got heads were happier six months later and were like more satisfied with their choice and would do it again than the people who got tails. Okay? And because I can't think of any other reason why the people who randomly got this virtual coin to turn up heads are any different from the people who got to turn up tails, the only logical conclusion I can make is that the people who got heads, they were both more likely to change, and they're happier. So I think that the causal arrow goes from making a change to being happier. Okay, subject to a bunch of caveats you can read about in the paper, which, but I still think that it's, uh, it's actually a true result. And so the answer that I now, so what's good is it's changed the way I think about the world. And whenever anybody asks me any question about anything, I always give the same answer, which is I tell them to quit. Okay? If you ever are on the margin at all, you should change what you're doing. Because at least according to this evidence, people are way too reluctant to change. And it should, on average, you should be, you know, if you change, if you're not sure what to do, you think you're going to kind of be the same outcome whether you change or not. But it looks like people don't change, quit stuff nearly, uh, nearly as much as they should. Okay. So that's, I, I've talked too much about economics, okay? But that's what economists do more or less, okay? They do things like randomized experiments, natural experiments, run regressions, 
Uh, you know, that's the way we think about the world. Okay, so what is made of the modern data science has a whole bunch of different names, okay? So things like random forest and cluster analysis and deep learning, okay? And it's not just that they have different names, but their techniques are completely and totally different than what economists do. And the easiest one for me to, to explain in a short amount of time is random forest, okay? So let me just explain as an example of how they do stuff, okay? So the basic idea is that you have some outcome Y, and you have two possible variables that can explain what or that, that yeah can explain what happens in y okay x1 and x2 and what you do is you start by building what's called a decision tree so a decision tree that's the following it says i'm going to do a cut of my data i'm going to cut my data into two pieces okay and i'm going to choose the the pieces i cut them into based on the cut that will maximize the difference between the two the two pieces of the data that are left, okay? So I basically slice part of my data to make, give me now two data sets, and the, the, the characteristic of these two pieces is that they're really unlike the other one. Okay, that's the first step in my tree. The next step in my tree is to look at what's the next cut I can make. So now I have two data sets. I can either cut the first data set, okay, so I look at the cut in the first data set that will make the biggest difference between what's left in that data set, or I can cut the second data set, and I find the one that makes the biggest difference between those two. Okay? And I just keep cutting up until some point of stopping rule that I've defined about where, where to stop. Okay? That's what a, a decision tree is. So here's an example where you start okay, in this variable. Uh, in this case, x1 and x2 each are allowed. We just, I, I'm not sure we generate the data. I think we just generate fake data here. x1 runs from 0 to 1, and x2 runs from 0 to 1. I think they're uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. Okay, and then we have some y variable. And so whenever the y variable is equal to one, the y variable is equal to, either equal to one or zero. When it's equal to one, it's a blue dot here. When it's equal to red, it's a, it's a, it's a zero. Okay, so the blue dots are one and the y variable and the, the red dots are zeros for the y variable. Okay, and so this is just our universe of data that we created. And when you start making these cuts, so the, the best cut you can make in the data that explains the most is divide the data between cases where x2 is um, less than 0.3 versus where x2 is greater than 0.3. So that would be this line right here. So the first cut of the decision tree split off this part of the data from this part of the data. Okay, then the next step is now you got where x1 is less than 0.88. Okay, so then you now cut this part from that part. Okay, and you just keep on cutting the data until you get to some, like you can't explain very much variation. Okay, that's a decision tree. Okay, so what I think is so so to an economist, this is a, a somewhat bizarre way to think about cutting up data. Okay, it's very, it's, it's like, it's, it's um, you know, hierarchical stuff. But, but what's most interesting is what you're left with at the end. Okay, so I don't know if you can read these numbers, but here you have this block here. Okay, and in this range, the, the mean value of y is 0.123. So y is almost always zero. So almost all these dots are red. But look right above it. The, all the blue dots are right there, okay? So on the line right between crossing over from here to here, like there's a huge change in your prediction, right? If you're just here, you're gonna predict that it's gonna be blue for sure. If you're just here, you're gonna think that it's likely to be red. It's super nonlinear, okay? So the defining characteristic of this and really all of the new modern data science techniques is that they are enormously nonlinear in the sense that they let small changes in your variables can lead to really radical predictions in what's going to happen in, in, in the world. Whereas in general, almost all economic models have a kind of feeling of linearity built into them. Okay? So this is a single decision tree. What a, what a random forest is, is you take uh, subsets of your data, you have like a million observations, and you take, say, 100,000 observations at a time, you pull out 100,000 observations, you build a decision tree, you put those 100,000 observations back in, you build another decision, you pull another 100,000, build another tree, and you do a bunch of those until you've built a forest of decision trees. And then what you do is you let each decision tree get to vote. Okay, so now you get a realization, like out of sample, of some particular sets of X1s and X2s, and then you let each decision tree have one vote about whether it thinks that Y is gonna be a one or a zero, and majority rules, okay? So that's, that's what the way these models look. Okay, so I didn't really explain to you the nuts and bolts of how we build econometric models, 
But I just got to say, it's, it's like nothing like this. There's zero familiarity to anyone who's done econometrics in what happens in this kind of a model. Okay, so then that's where you just say, well, this is super weird uh, that these exist. So, so now let me kind of give my sense of what modern data science, uh, the core of it is, okay? The core of it is, it is theory free, okay? Look, it's just a way of cutting up the data and it doesn't care why you're cutting up the data, okay? Whereas opposed to econometrics, at least pretends to care deeply about the whys that are underneath it, okay? You, you, you at least pretend that you have a model in mind when you go and run the data and that that model is what you're testing. Okay. Interestingly, it's focused almost all on correlation and pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is just another way of saying correlation, right? So, so these tools turn out to be, empirically it turns out, they turn out to be incredibly good at like telling you whether it's a dog or a cat, okay? Better than econometric models of trying to get the features of a picture and then tell you whether it's a dog or a cat. These things figure out whether things are dogs or cats, okay? Um, admittedly, uh, they're like self you know, ob they're, they're obviously black boxy, right? You, you plug stuff in, and even when you get the answers out, you often can't exactly tell why the model told you to do what, it tells you it's a dog or a cat, but you don't really understand why the model thinks it's a dog or a cat, okay? But the fact is, when it comes to the kind of problems they've been applied to, they are really, really effective. Far more effective than the kind, when economists try usually to, to build a model that, that does what these models do using our tools, we're not as good as these tools are at doing it. Okay. All right. So now, back to key questions quickly, because I do want to leave you a chance to do questions. Okay, why are the two approaches so different uh, is the first question, okay? And the first one is in part because there's a different mindset of how economists think about the world and how computer scientists think about the world, okay? But I don't want to oversell that, because I think that's actually the least important reason why these things are so different, okay? The real reason they're different, and once you see it, it makes it totally obvious, is that they were designed to do two totally different things. What economists try to do with data is we try to explain why something has happened in the past, right? We take a historical data set, we try to understand it, and we try to, we try to put the reasons and the causal arrows into it, okay? When people use the data science approaches, they almost invariably are only interested about predicting the future, okay? So when Netflix wants to figure out what movie you are likely to like, they do not care at all about why you're going to like that movie or what your background is or what would happen if a completely different set of movies were released. All they care about is can they put a movie in front of you that you're going to like so you keep on sticking with Netflix and not doing something else. Okay? And so interestingly, it turns out that um, predicting the future in a static world is roughly the only interesting question that exists where correlation is good enough, okay? As long as the world is the same tomorrow as it is today, okay, and I know that, who cares why today turned out the way it did today, tomorrow's also gonna more or less turn out the way today is too, okay? And that's the premise of modern data science, essentially, is that, the world, that, that what happened in the past is gonna happen in the future, and so I don't need to understand why. So it's interesting, okay, and it was surprising to me, it took me a while to see that, that that really is like modern data science is the king of correlation, right? And so it is the king of predicting as long as you're predicting the world where stuff's gonna be the same, okay? Now, the problem is that, um, well, let me not get ahead of myself, okay? And the last thing I was gonna say that the other reason that they're different is that modern data science only asks questions when there's enough data to ask it using modern data science approaches. It turns out modern data science is very greedy about needing data relative to old economic approaches. And so there are lots of questions you wouldn't even think to try to answer with modern techniques that economists are quite content to try and tackle because we don't need so much data because we impose more in the way of theory onto things, okay? So will modern data science make the economic approach irrelevant? Okay, so the obvious answer to that question is no, okay? Because for the thing that economic econometrics does, which is explaining the past, modern data science has not, and I don't think ever will prove itself to be particularly useful, okay? Uh, and, but look, the, the fact is, if you then you go and think about it, is mostly people don't care that much about what economists do, right? So it, it turns out in business <laughs> and in practice, predicting the future turns out to be a lot more important than explaining the past, okay? 
And uh, it's just economists just haven't been in the business of explaining the future, you know, predicting the future. It's not our forte. It's not what we think our job is. Okay. And so I think I, we have lots of job security as economists because businesses don't care about understanding why the past is the way it is. So economists can keep on doing that. Okay. So what should we borrow though? Okay. It seems kind of sensible. There's all these new techniques. What is in it that economists can, can use? Okay. The first thing for sure is that when in those rare cases, and they're quite rare where economists are actually in the business of prediction, uh, I think it's silly for economists not to use the data science tools because they are simply empirically almost always turned out in a horse race to do better than the, um, than the, the econometric models in doing pure prediction things when you have really thick data. Okay? The other thing that I think is more holistic but is the bigger value to economics is that modern data science has had a spirit to it which is just that everything is data. Words are data, images are data, that you can do, you can basically exploit anything and turn it into data. And that is a really smart and important idea that economists didn't really latch onto. Economists mostly thought that data was the stuff that the government produced and put into data tapes and books. And, and always it was numbers and always it was rectangular in the sense that there was like the way data was structured was there's a, a state and it has a bunch of variables about it. Okay? But anyway, it's super important. Like even stuff like voice and face, everything is data. Okay? And that's the thing that if you are uh, a researcher or someone using data in business, your mantra should be everything is data. It's just a matter of whether I'm clever enough and have the right tools to turn that thing into data that I can use to be effective. Okay? Um, there's little stuff that a bunch of accounts write about how we can do like things slightly better in bidding. I don't care about that. Okay. But the fourth thing that I think is um, you know, potentially harder to see, but um, interesting is that if modern techniques get good enough, like so look, of course, if modern AI becomes better than humans at doing what humans do, well then you can like then we don't need economists anymore, right? Because it'll be better. But but more subtle is that these techniques might be really good at brute force looking for natural experiments and then churning those up so that economists could then try to like use the human element to try to determine whether they're natural experiments. Because what, what these techniques do a lot of is they, they look for these highly nonlinear things. So you know they might say, um, you know, for some reason, patients who have these seven characteristics all at the same time tend to die a lot, even though if you only have six of them, you don't die any more than other patients, okay? And then that might be something that would lead economists or doctors in this case to say, okay, can I think of a theory why those seven things together might be a sign of some underlying causal thing? So we might be able to use techniques in that way, okay? Okay, so what, if anything, can the economic approaches contribute to modern science? I think this is actually a more important question because I don't think people are really asking this very much, uh, as, as opposed to a lot of people are asking the other dimension. Okay, the first is that in a number of cases, I've been asked to build economic models in settings in which other people have built data science, modern data science models. And what's interesting is uh, their models always beat my models in terms of prediction, but the correlation between my predictions and their predictions is actually really low. It's often like 0.5 or 0.6, okay? And if you have two signals uh, that are not very correlated, if you take a weighted average of those two, you can actually do better than either signal alone. Now you put more weight on the data science one than you do on the econ econometric one, but having multiple like relatively independent signals is really, really useful in prediction problems. And so for a couple times we worked with companies and, um, and were able to convince them that some kind of old fashioned approaches really had real value for them because it gave such different answers relative to the, the kinds of answers they were getting with newer approaches. Okay. Um, the other thing is that in a world that's changing, the world can change faster than data are generated that the modern tech need, techniques use to keep up. So the, the, the model can't keep up with the changes. And that's another case where you can obviously see why you'd want to use the old techniques, which are more anchored in causality. Uh, so in a, if you have a model anchored in causality, even if the world changes, you can often use theory to make a prediction about what will happen in the new world. We're in a new world, right? So, so at Netflix, if something totally changes and now, um, you know, and now, I don't know what it is, uh, you know, I don't know what the change would be in Netflix. You know, suddenly we have a, a whole new, like people stop watching regular movies and they only watch, you know, 
virtual reality 3D movies, like overnight. Like their old models aren't gonna predict much of anything until they have enough new data on the virtual reality stuff. But economic models might tell you something about what the transitions uh, might offer, okay? Um, as I said before, if there's enough data around, it's also true that if you're faced with no estimate at all because you don't have enough data to do modern techniques, you could, you could fall back on the techniques uh, economists have used. Okay, my last point, which is almost um, unrelated, and I'll take some questions, but it's, I think, in some sense, the most fun fundamental insight that's come to me over time is that oftentimes when you talk to people, there's this idea that big data is kind of enough by itself, right? There's just a big data, it solves all of your problems, okay? And I have come to believe that that's not true at all. In fact, what I've come to believe, not only is big data not an answer by, by itself, but there's actually a complementarity between ideas and big data, not a substitutability, right? So it's like, if you have big data and you have great ideas, you can do amazing things you couldn't have done either without ideas or without big data, okay? But just having one or the other, ideas and no data, or data and no ideas, I think actually leads you to a terrible place. And, um, and I've worked with a lot of companies. I have not worked with a lot of companies have, that have a lot of ideas and no data. I've worked with lots of companies that have a lot of data and no ideas. And I can tell you, I've never seen a good outcome uh, from the use of data at the companies that simply don't have any ideas, but have amazing data that they imagine should have answers to everything, but they, can't, they literally cannot think of the question to ask. And so what they do is they stockpile terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, uh, which becomes a bigger and bigger <laughs> burden on them how to keep track of it. And they never do anything with it except like draw incredibly terrible inferences, which um, end up leading them to make bad decisions. In essence, decisions worse than they would have made uh, if they hadn't. So look, uh, I, I think the future belongs to companies and, and situations and uh, people who have big data. Okay, big data is incredibly valuable, uh, and it will make those of you who also have great ideas um, much more productive as well. Okay, so let me stop there. I only have just a few minutes for questions, but I'm happy to take them on whatever you see fit. We have microphones here, if anybody has anything to say. All right, if no one wants, I, so we could either let people go or I can, um, I can just keep on talking. Should I tell some stories? Oh, here's some, here's a brave soul. Yep. <clears throat> Hi. Hello? Yes. Um, I have a really brief question. I just wanted to hear more about sort of the way you described the coin tossing experiment. I feel like it was counterintuitive steps that you've taken um, from sort of sampling and the way you wanted to approach gathering data. The conclusion from yeah. my voice, I didn't know it can do that. Um, and then the conclusions that you drew from that data yeah. were really like not intuitive. So sort of how did you think about the process? Yeah. Did you have a method from this, or did the experiment kind of, you know, have, have a life of its own as you've gathered data and you did change some things about it as time went on? Yeah, no, it pretty much was um, the, the, the coin tossing experiment. So the question is like, I don't know if you could hear The coin tossing question was, did I was, I was, the, the, the the question is, so I was kind of surprised at the, what seemed to be logical jumps and fallacies um, in what you did in the coin toss experiment, and did it emerge whole cloth, or did it change along the way what you're thinking, okay? So, in fact, here's how my thinking went, okay? My thought was the perfect, okay, I learned this from Michael, actually. So Michael's the first one who ever told me to do this. Michael, in, whenever a student is presenting results, will say to them, if you could have exactly the data set you wanted, the perfect data set, what would it look like? You still ask that question, Michael? Okay, so Michael asked that question, okay? And I thought to myself, what is the perfect question, perfect data, if you want to understand about, say, quitting your job and should you do it, okay? And what I would want is I would want people who are exactly on the margin for quitting your job. I want the people who wake up every morning and say, my God, I hate my job, I want to quit my job, okay? But they just like, kind of either they don't, sometimes they quit, sometimes they don't, okay? That's in essence the perfect data, because. I don't, want to, uh, Sam, I don't want to fire a bunch of people who love their jobs and see if they're happy or not, because they're not on the margin. It's all about people on the margin, because whenever you're having trouble making decisions, you're on the margin, okay? And so what I wanted to find was a pool of people who were so undecided about whether they wanted to get divorced or quit their job, 
that they would come to my idiotic website and flip my idiotic coin, right? So that is like the definition of somebody's on the margin. If, if, if a virtual coin can sway your decision, you are really, truly on the margin, okay? And so it was the per for me, really, it was the perfect data set. Now, what was not perfect about it is the fact that when I then tried to, is that I couldn't really sit on the shoulder of these people or get inside their head and know how they really felt. So I had to rely on them telling me how they felt. I had to rely on them responding to my survey. So not everybody, when I contacted them six months later, wanted to come back and talk to me. Now, partly I dealt with that by being clever up front. And when you said you were going to flip a coin, I also asked you to name a friend okay, who, could, um, who, who you would also tell about the decision, who then I could go and talk to and ask what really happened. Did he really quit his job? Did he really, is he happier? And he's lying to me, okay? And so it's good that I had these third parties who didn't have the same incentive to lie. And not, not like anyone had a very strong incentive to lie, but I think one thing we learned in experiments is that people try to do, experimental subjects try to do what the experimenter wants, okay? And so when, when people were told to quit their jobs, I'm afraid they might tell me, yeah, I did quit my job because they wanted me to make me happy. And then if I asked them later, were they happy? I, maybe they would tell me they were happy because they thought I wanted them to be happy, okay? But the third parties who like, didn't even know who I was and why I was writing them, I thought were much less likely to want to come out and say, oh, yeah, um, lie to me and say this guy was really happy and this guy quit his job and stuff like that. So, so um, but, but in essence, the, this is one of the unusual papers I've written where from the very beginning, I knew exactly what I was going to do, exactly how it outlines data and what I expected to see as opposed to, usually I just get a pile of data, I start thinking about it, and I kind of worry about the details of it. Okay, let me take one more quick question, and then I'll, I'll let you guys go. Oh, you thank you it. so much. Uh, I kind of wonder, can you elaborate more about your startup? What is your startup trying to do after yeah. like, your fantastic speech about yeah, so, interaction? Yeah, um, so our them? startup, look, uh, my basic experience, so I've been really lucky, right? So, so for an academic economist, I've had an incredible ability to talk to people, the opportunity to talk to people, right? So a book that's, that's highly read, this podcast, and you know, I can, I can get 25,000 people to um, you know, get divorced or not get divorced um, on, on like, just like a, whatever. But what's interesting is I cannot point to any successful change in public policy, for better or for worse, that I think has happened because of my research. I, I, I think the world... The out, most of the outcomes in the world, at least directly, would be exactly the same if I had never been here at all. Okay? And it's, it's an interesting, it's a telling statement about the inability of research, at least my kind of research, to have an impact on things. Okay? And in some sense, should I care about that? I'm not sure if I care about that or not. Okay? But, but I've gotten to an age where I think it would be kind of, mostly I think it would be fun to try to go and change the world and do stuff. And in particular, my own view of the world is that um, when things are easy to do, people go and do them. And when you will be showered with accolades and love because you go out and do something that feels really good, then people go and do them. So I think a lot of the easy things that philanthropists can do, they've already been done, okay? Um, I'll give you this. So I talked to one very prominent philanthropist, and, and he was talking about a problem, and I suggested a solution to that problem. He acknowledged that that would probably would be a good solution, and he said, but the thing is, the only reason I do philanthropy is because I want people to like me. Okay? And if I did what you said, people wouldn't like me. So I'm not going to do it. Okay? So in a world in which that's the case, I think there's room for someone like me who doesn't really care whether people like me or not <laughs> to go out and try to make the world a better place by doing the kinds of things that other people like who care maybe more about their reputation or maybe they want to run for president someday or whatever that they don't want to do that kind of thing. So essentially, what my you know, startup wants to do is to find really smart people and um, to take ideas we have. But also, I mean, the thing is, I believe that there are amazing ideas out in the world. And through the Freakonomics platform, there are a lot, and, and sometimes good ideas are attached to people who want to spend their life pursuing those ideas. But more often than not, it's like people like my dad. My dad is just like a happy doctor who does his thing. But I'd say over my lifetime, my dad has told me five amazing ideas that I think could like potentially have in very small ways some world changing. But my dad's not going to go and quit being a doctor and go start something. So, so I think we have the possibility to crowdsource really amazing ideas that other people don't have access to and then you know, glean the best of those and really go and put them into practice. But the problem is that ideas alone don't win. 
Okay? What I've learned is that you can't go to a, a, a funder or an implementer and say, I have a great idea. You have to go with more. You have to go with something like a prototype. You have to go with an example of how it works. It has to be really simple. And so what I want this organization to be able to do is to take ideas and turn them into you know, the equivalent of a business plan or a prototype or a device that can then actually be there for people. Because people don't often have imagination, myself included, about what other people think. But if you actually put, like look, I never, I, I thought, why would I want a cell phone? What could I possibly do with a cell phone? My life is perfect without a cell phone. Why would someone make a cell phone, okay? 10 years later, like, I can't even imagine what life was without a cell phone. But I needed, someone had to put a cell phone in my hand or I had to see friends use cell phones to see it. So in essence, that's kind of what we want this um, startup to do. And, but we don't want to, we're not going to be massive like implementers or manufacturers. We want to be kind of intermediaries who then find, you know, like, like using a market test, we want to be able to like sell in an intellectual sense our ideas to the kinds of people who would go and implement them or would want to like take them and do business. So. Uh, that's uh, that. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, <laughs> okay, that was a uh, terrific speech by Steve. I just wanted to highlight uh, like one part of it that uh, was my, my favorite part. Steve has this incredible manner of talking where it's, in, you know, oh, it's not a big deal. I didn't do, you know, everyone doing it. So he said that's what economists would do. Uh, and so I just want to underscore, Steve, among the many things he's gotten, uh, he's accomplished, he got 25,000 people to flip a coin and uh, change their life. And what I, but th I think there's something larger to take from that that I just want to underscore for all of you. It strikes at Steve's willingness to think about the world in a way, th it, that the world doesn't have to be the way it is. Uh, and that, as he was saying, uh, theory and ideas combined with data uh, can often allow you to alter the world or shape the world in a new way. Uh, and so I think it was just a terrific speech for, uh, and the lesson I don't want to be missed is that I encourage all of you to think about how not to be afraid about thinking about how the world could be different than it is uh, and change it in some way. So thanks, Steve. <laughs>